Good morning, Theory of Knowledge, class of 2020. Today for class number 15, we're going to be talking about religion and identity as we continue our study of identity, the formation and organization of concepts of the self. So, religion and identity, what do you know? Since our last couple of classes, we've been talking about uh, gender and sexuality, I thought I'd tackle something uncontroversial, something easy, something no one could ever possibly take offense about, uh, with. Today, we're going to be talking about religion. Uh, this presentation contains discussions of religion and belief that are appropriate to our studies. As always, our language will, uh, one hopes, be both forthright and accurate. You've got to be respectful. Uh, if you're not mature enough for this, you are not ready for college work. Whether you are deeply religious, whether you identify as spiritual but not religious, whether you are orthodox, heterodox, whether you are atheist, agnostic, uh, if there are a billion people who share your religious faith or if there are none, you've got to be able to separate your personal judgments from the topic at hand. Because we're not only talking about how you formed your identity, but how others form theirs. And religion can be a greater or lesser part of that. Understanding this is important to our studies. So talking about religion and identity, we're specifically going to look at the concept of religious identity, that, that subset. Uh, not so much the influence that religion has on other aspects of identity, but the idea of a religious identity itself. Uh, tomorrow's lesson, uh, we will be looking in more detail at the interchange, the interplay between religion and other aspects of identity, such as gender, culture, ethnicity. But today we're going to focus on the formation of religious identity itself. In academic terms, a religion is an organized system of beliefs, uh, usually relying on a, uh, on a series of, of axioms to explain the universe. Uh, it often has a mythological core. Uh, some people get upset when we talk about religion being based on myth. We have to understand here that we're using myth simply to describe things which cannot be described uh, or which are not described through a rigorous or scientific process, but are culturally inherited. Uh, religious knowledge systems as a uh, area of knowledge include faith, revelation, inspiration. Uh, they may include scholarship, which is based on language and reason. So religion is a subject which touches on multiple ways of knowing and creates its own unique area of knowledge. We're interested in religion today because it impacts the formation of per personal identity, and it does so either by its presence or its absence. Being a religious or irreligious can be as essential to your character formation as being religious. Today's society, uh, across, global society across the world, places a level of importance upon religious identity uh, to the extent that it is unique, to the extent that it is shared. So it's important to understand that simply opting out of the system and saying, well, I'm not religious, or uh, I don't believe in a, a formal religion, does not remove religious identity from the equation. It simply narrows your personal definition. There's nothing wrong with that. But understanding that other people will have different definitions is part of our approach here in TOK.
In her lesson on religion, key concepts and definitions, Erin Long Crowell uh, gives a brief definition of religion as it applies to her study of sociology. Uh, but she makes the excellent point that throughout history, religion has been a central part of all known human societies. And sociologists study religion to understand religious experiences around the world and how religion is tied to other social institutions. In parallel, we'll be studying religion as it is tied to identity. This is not about judgment. This is not about right or wrong or evaluating or contrasting religions for the purpose of uh, some kind of one-upsmanship. What we're looking for here is to determine why religions and their particular forms impact individuals. If you multiply that individual impact, you get the sociological impact, how religions affect societies as a whole. When we talk about religious identity, we're talking about a very specific type of identity formation. Specifically, we're talking about the sense of group membership to religion and the importance of this group membership as it pertains to one's self-concept. Although the details of your religious belief do impact your sense of self and your persona, a more significant factor when considering religious identity is group membership, whether you consider yourself to be isolated uh, in a, a group of, uh, that is a my religious minority or, or even a singular religious belief when you believe that there is no one who shares your religious concept, uh, or whether you consider yourself a member of uh, Catholicism, for example, the single largest religious denomination uh, in the world. Um, Christianity overall uh, is the largest religious group. The largest factor of that is Catholicism. Uh, Islam makes up the second largest cluster of, of uh, religious identities. But whether you are Sikh, Hindu, uh, First Nation, whether you believe in uh, Wolf Brother and Raven, or whether you believe in the Trinity, or whether you believe in the Flying Spaghetti Monster, yes, that is an actual religion. Uh, it is the sense of membership in that group and the associated cluster of beliefs, of belonging, of reinforced values, uh, that creates your sense of religious identity. And specifically, the impact of the membership in that group. So when you think about religious identity, I want you to separate the specifics of the religious belief of the individual from the importance of the belief itself as a, a passport to membership within a group. So just as we have a ethnic identity or a gender identity and a religious identity, um, we have an overall overarching personal identity, the identity which to more or less successful degree integrates all of these other aspects. Ethnic identity interacts with religious identity in some interesting ways. Studies have shown that first and second generation uh, immigrants, that minorities, that uh, certain gender groups all have an impact on your, uh, on your religious identity. Specifically in ethnic identities, when individuals are, are of ethnic minority backgrounds, they feel their identity is threatened. This may emphasize other social identities, such as religious identity, to maintain a positive self-concept. In other words, uh, if you feel that you are threatened because of your ethnicity, you may rally around your membership in your religious group. 
Uh, this idea is supported by studies that have shown higher levels of religious identity in the United States among ethnic minorities, uh, particularly Latino and African American backgrounds, compared to European American, uh, Caucasian uh, Americans. We, and this is not a indication that these groups are particularly more religious. Um, in groups where African or Latino, uh, in societies where African uh, or Latino individuals are the majority, white minorities also show this heightened sense of religiosity. Um, when you look at American expatriates in Costa Rica, for example, you see that they tend to identify more strongly with evangelical Protestantism than the in a reaction to the uh, the largely Roman Catholic, uh, largely Latino uh, environment in which they find themselves. So it's not the membership of the group, it's the size and strength of your group in the social hierarchy that directly impacts your uh, sense of religious identity. And again, that's for groups as a whole. Um, sociology deals with human beings in, in mass. Um, the social sciences uh, or the human sciences like, like economics or sociology or psychology are very, very good at understanding what large groups of people are going to do, to believe, or how they'll behave. They're terrible at predicting individual actions, okay? Uh, it's kind of like the difference between chemistry and quantum mechanics and the physical science. Um, we're very, very good at understanding how a group of molecules in one solution will react when it, uh, mixed with a new compound. We're very, very, very bad at predicting where an individual electron uh, is going to be at any given time. In fact, uh, quantum theory states that we can't actually know the location of any given electron at any given time, that it exists in a quantum state. We can only deal with probabilities. Human beings are kind of the same way. In large groups, we're manageable and predictable, but individually, you just never know what somebody's going to do. There are also impacts on religious identity related to gender and gender differences. Um, generally speaking, most societies, uh, most religious groups, women are more likely than men to attend religious services, to express that religion is a important aspect of their lives. Um, in American culture, uh, especially in the, the 20th century, there was often an idea in uh, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, culture that men attended to the weak and women attended to the church uh, on, on the weekend. Um, this is a handy way of saying that women only worked one day a week compared to men's five and obviously represents gender bias, but it, it does... It, it, it is a common idea. In The Crucible, um, a play by Arthur Miller um, ta that takes place during the Salem Witch Trials, John Proctor, the protagonist, uh, makes a comment to the effect that uh, his wife pretty much handles the church for, for both of them. Um, now, when we say that men and women have different roles within religious identity, please note, as we discussed earlier, gender is not a binary. It is a spectrum. Uh, LGBTQ plus individuals often have very complex relations with religious identity and religious organizations because being, generally speaking, more traditional, uh, more conservative in their sociological and social approaches, many churches have an implicit, implicit uh, 
gender binary bias. They see things in terms of men and women. There are religious traditions which include roles for non-binary individuals or individuals otherwise on the LGBTQ plus spectrum. Uh, this is a pretty good uh, time to, I think, just put, put a pin in this for further study at a, at a later date because there is so much potential change here and there's so much interaction of all these different factors it's something of a moving target let's just say that within societies that enforce a gender binary stereotype women tend to be more uh, religiously and active and therefore have a stronger religious identity component than men in their equivalent society So getting back to the idea of, of ethnicity, um, even within ethnic groups, we do see differences uh, between native born and immigrant populations when it comes to religious identity. Um, first and second generation individuals, that is people who either themselves are immigrants or whose parents are immigrants, tend to have higher religious identity levels in comparison to later generation immigrants or native born uh, resident, uh, native, native born citizens. We see this again because of the isolating nature of immigration, that immigrants tend to band together in communities with like ideas, ideals, cultural uh, impacts, for protection, association, comfort, familiarity, uh, to aid in the stress of integration. Whereas later generations facing assimilation pressures uh, tend to de-emphasize their religious identity levels. Doesn't mean that religion becomes unimportant to immigrant populations. It means that the longer you are in a, the longer that you and your family are a member of society, the less a particular religious identity tradition impacts your sense of personal identity. Uh, other factors start to become more exaggerated uh, or more, more meaningful so that you start to represent the baseline population much more closely. You tend to be no more or less religiously oriented than other native born uh, individuals. I hope that made sense. We're gonna talk about assimilation uh, another day, but it is a concept that is interesting, fascinating, complicated, threatening, uh, controversial, so it sounds just right for theory of knowledge. Okay, and that brings us to the end of class 15 on religion and religious identity. I want you to start thinking for your reflection today. Um, we're not going to do a, a Padlet or response yet. We're going to save that for, for a little bit later. But today, I just want you to spend some time thinking about your own experiences with religious identity, your own uh, spiritual or religious backgrounds, your own beliefs. Um, if it's true that the unexamined life is not worth living, then we need to make our lives meaningful by examining our own lives. Um, how do explorations of your spirituality make use of the TOK ways of knowing. To what extent is your religious identity shaped by language, the stories and literature that you were exposed to, uh, by sense perception, what you can see, hear, feel, by emotion, reason, imagination, faith and intuition are obvious avenues for religious uh, identity. There are some people whose religion is entirely based on intuition, emotion, and faith. 
the idea of direct inspiration. They are moved by the spirit of their beliefs. There are other people whose religious identity is largely cultural. It is memory. It is language. It is reason. Uh, it is the traditions. Uh, when we read Green Eggs and Ham for the first time, we talked about the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Uh, it may be worth revisiting that vocabulary in your workbook at this time. But I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about your spirituality and the theory of knowledge ways of knowing. Being able to discuss our experiences in terms of the areas of knowledge and ways of knowing is going to be critical for your uh, your TOK essay and your TOK oral presentations, which are the two primary assessments for this course. That brings us to the end of lesson 15. Um, for Plato and a Platypus, I'm going to ask that you keep reading. Um, by the time we get back from spring break, I would like everyone to have read the first four chapters and either annotated in the text or taken notes separately. Uh, don't forget to include critical vocabulary in your TOK workbook. But let's keep up, please, with the reading in Plato and a Platypus. We haven't had much time to discuss it so far, but there will come a day. And trying to cram an entire book of philosophy and jokes is going to be very difficult. Uh, please keep up with your reading. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to working with you soon.